Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Tony Mills, a uh, senior fellow at the R Street Institute here in Washington, D.C., uh, and director of our science policy program. Uh, so we're here today to talk about the importance of basic research in the life sciences in light of coronavirus. Um, you know, obviously, the coronavirus crisis has thrust the issue of scientific research to the forefront of our public uh, debates and discussions. Um, it's also, uh, I would say, re-enlivened uh, the issue of federal R&D generally, um, or the U.S. R&D uh, landscape. And one of the issues that I think is uh, slightly under uh, discussed in this area is basic science. Um, and this is unfortunate given the importance that uh, basic scientific research, especially in the life sciences, has for a lot of the efforts that are underway now to combat the coronavirus, um, but also more generally. Um, the National Institutes of Health has been now for decades the principal source of non-defense R&D and the federal government, um, and particularly uh, the principal patron of basic science. And so it stands to reason that uh, discussion about NIH's role would be valuable in this context. Um, there are, however, I think some trends that may be worrisome about uh, underinvesting in this area. Um, this is part of a broader um, uh, trend, which has seen the federal government cede some of its role uh, in U.S. R&D, and especially a, uh, a shift away from a focus on basic science. And so that's, that's what we're here to talk about today, um, thinking about long-term strategies for uh, 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 federal R&D policy, especially with a view to basic research, um, to be better prepared for public health threats like the one that we're currently dealing with. Um, so we have a terrific panel um, here to discuss this issue. Um, so I'd like to begin just by uh, introducing our panelists. Um, so first we have Paula Cohen, uh, who is a professor of genetics and associate vice provost for the life sciences at Cornell University. Uh, next, we have Robert Cook Deegan, professor at Arizona State University's School for the Future of Innovation and Society. He's also the author of The Gene Wars, which is a sort of definitive history of the uh, Human Genome Project. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we have John Lorsch, who's director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences at NIH. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us and for taking the time to uh, share your, your, your expertise with us. Um, before kicking things over to the panel, uh, I would like to just sort of lay a few ground rules for the, uh, the event today. Um, we are hoping to leave some time at the end for some audience uh, Q&A. Uh, so please feel free to, to ask questions. Um, when, if you do that, um, please use the Q&A function on Zoom rather than chat, if you can. That will make it easier for me to, uh, to uh, sort of see all the questions as they come in. Uh, and feel free to ask at any point, although we will try to get to them at the end. Um, one other thing I would say uh, for any folks from media who are joining, uh, we ask that you respect the Chatham House rule. Uh, so essentially, uh, feel free to write about this, but refrain from attributing uh, identity or institutional affiliation or anything like that. Um, without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to our panel to talk about uh, our, our topic today, uh, beginning with uh, Robert Cook Deegan. Bob? So Antonio, if you could uh, flash the first slide up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give kind of a, a, a running start at this by covering some of the history of the post-war development of biomedical research funding. And I'm going to focus on the basic end or the research part of the R&D budget um, and focus in particular on the NIH component. Um, so just to remind everybody, right after World War II, the world changed. Uh, NIH went into World War II with a budget of $700,000. Um, and it was therefore not a major funder of biomedical research uh, in the United States. In fact, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, um, and individual hospitals and private philanthropy were the main supports for biomedical research um, going into World War II. But during World War II, the world changed. And as the war was coming to an end, um, Harley Kilgore, who's the senator who's in the upper left corner of, of the slide, um, was, uh, had introduced a bill 
to consolidate. One of the things that came out of World War II was an awareness that science really matters, not just for discovery and not just as an intellectual pursuit, but as a very practical source of the ideas and knowledge and technologies that give rise to economic growth and practical applications. During the war, it became really apparent because of, uh, in fact, a lot of people attributed winning the war to the Allies because of the development of radar. Um, and uh, another super important invention during World War II was actually penicillin, and I'll loop back to that in a minute. Um, and then, of course, uh, the atomic bomb kind of put an exclamation mark on the importance of science during World War II. So while the war was still underway, and as it became obvious that it was going to end, um, Senator Kilgore introduced a bill to create a National Science Foundation. Um, and uh, he introduced that bill in 1943, and it got serious pushback from the guys that are on the right side here. Um, the, 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 guy, the, the two guys in their glasses there, one of those is Van Ever Bush. He's the taller guy. And then, of course, President Truman is on the right. Um, Truman was a populist Democrat and, in fact, uh, became president when um, Roosevelt died of hypertensive crisis before the war ended. Uh, Van Ever Bush, during the war, had become the most powerful scientist in the world. He ran something called the um, Office of Scientific Research and Development um, that coordinated the research efforts during World War II. And um, in response to the bill that Kilgore had introduced in 1943, Van Ever Bush basically invited himself to write a report about what should happen with science after the war. Um, and President Roosevelt signed that letter. And the report that came back to him is a very famous one called Science, the Endless Frontier. Um, that Bush wrote more or less in response to the Kilgore idea. Um, and actually, Kilgore and uh, Bush agreed on much more than they disagreed about. They both agreed on an incredibly important role for the federal government to, to fill the gap in funding basic science as a public good that would give rise to all sorts of valuable things, including economic gro growth and all sorts of practical applications. They disagreed, however, on who should set priorities. Uh, Van Ever Bush was kind of a, a, a patrician and a more or less conservative guy who wanted to leave the decisions to scientists. And Kilgore said, no, it's part of the government and it should be tightly linked to um, the uses of the technology. Um, so the, uh, the, there was a debate that went on. Uh, the bill that emerged from the Kilgore bill reintroduced in right at the end of the war uh, was actually vetoed by President Truman because in part of this who's going to control the budget. Um, and the other thing that both Bush and Kilgore agreed on was that there should be one central ministry that does all of research. That would be high energy physics, military research, and health research. Um, and both of them were actually rather disappointed when that didn't happen in the post-war period. Um, what happened instead was that um, the military had obviously discovered the value of science and the Office of Naval Research, and then the Army, and then when the Air Force was created in 1947, each of the armed services built up their own research capacity and started funding it. Um, and then the Atomic Energy Commission inherited the um, high energy physics portfolio and its budget was pretty big. And it was completely separate from this National Research Foundation. And then at the same time, uh, right after the war, Mary Lasker and her husband began to push the uh, political strategy of using what's now called the American Cancer Society to argue that Congress should support biomedical research in a big way. So that introduced a huge infusion of new money to NIH in the post-war period. And then of course, of course um, by 1950, the NSF was actually created, not really under the model of either Kilgore or Bush, but kind of a compromise. Um, and then post Sputnik, we had the creation of DARPA and the national, uh, and NASA, which became the civilian space agency. Um, but just to flag that history and pull a few things out that I think are still relevant. Um, 
there's still a disagreement about who should set the priorities. Um, and there's a disagreement about how tight the linkage should be between science and its applications. Um, and I'll, I'll flag that in just a minute when I go to the second slide. A third unresolved issue is the importance of social science. And I think COVID has made apparent that it's not just the technical means that matter in response to a, 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 a public health crisis. It's actually the delivery of care and the role of different constituencies and understanding the political system that's just as important in determining the outcomes of a, of a crisis as the underlying technical and scientific uh, aspects. So social science is part of the science that is important. Kilgore was a big supporter of social science. Bush was extremely skeptical of including the social sciences in his National Research Foundation. And then finally, there was a disagreement at the end of World War II about what to do about patents. And we'll come back to that at the very end of my presentation. Uh, Antonio, if you could switch to the second slide. So this is a slide that kind of takes up from the end of the Lasker era for NIH. And I want to do two things with this slide. The really obvious thing here is, number one, this is only research dollars. This is not R&D dollars. This is the research component dollars deflated to a single uh, uh, year. And what it shows is how consistent and how much larger NIH got. Because at the beginning of this graph, its account is actually obscured by the walls behind DOD and NASA. But by the mid 1970s, NIH was bigger than them. And by the end, NIH is accounting for more than half, 53% of the dollars that go into research for all of the federal government. So NIH kind of breaks away from the pack in the 1970s and becomes the dominant research support, meaning that most of Congress's attention for, for basic research is shifting in the direction of biomedical research. Another thing to notice there is that uh, it includes not just NIH, but something called Adamha that some of you may or may not remember but it was the Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration. Um, that's a result, actually, of a fissioning of NIH in 1967 when the Mental Health Institute was split off and was separated from NIH for uh, 25 years. And it was reunified only in 1993. The reason NIH, NIMH was split off is a debate that I think is going to come back after COVID, which was because of the majority of the NIMH budget was actually going for services, for community mental health services, but it was bundled under a National Institute budget. Um, and the debate internally was, well, is that really an NIH function or isn't it? And the splitting away from NIH was uh, occasioned by realizing, oh my gosh, well, NIMH is different because it's delivering, more of its budget's going to delivering services than it is to doing research. And then when NIMH and the other two institutes that were created in Adamha, drug abuse and mental and, uh, and uh, uh, alcohol and drug abuse, NIDA, NIMH, and uh, NIAAA, they were reunified, but only the research units were associated with NIH. Um, so that kind of illustrates this, this hybrid and what is NIH's role and how tightly should it be coupled to the health outcomes that we're looking for. Um, flip to the last slide now. And one of the features that has never been fully resolved, going all the way back to World War II, is what is the federal role compared to the role of government and the role of industry? And this idea of the triple helix, government, industry, and academe working in concert, um, it's, there's been a recurrent debate that has been resolved to some level of steady state for periods of time that I think is resurgent now, including the debate about what's the federal role, what should happen with patents that result from federally funded research. In 1980, the Bayh-Dole Act was passed to, to make policy consistent and reduce transaction costs and delegate the power of uh, allowing patenting of inventions arising from federal funding um, that went out from the government to universities and nonprofits and small businesses to the units that got the money from NIH. 
And that's the same thing was happening at DOD and Department of Energy. Um, that coincided almost exactly with the spawning of the biotech revolution. And we've lived through many decades where we've kind of understood that that's just the way it works. Um, federal funding is the source. NIH, if you look far enough back, uh, a recent study just done last year showed that 100% of 210 agents that have been put on the market um, in the past four or five decades have some reliance on NIH funding at some stage in their, their development. Usually, however, most of that money goes to defining the targets. And we rely on industry to build the arrows that hit that target, the drugs, devices, and vaccines that are developed out of the basic research. So we've got this, this uh, complex ecosystem that includes universities, governments, and industry. Um, and we've kind of left it to the system to decide um, what the priorities are going to be. And the debate about patent rights hasn't ever been fully resolved, but we do have kind of a, a functional assessment that is right now more controversial again than it has been probably for two decades. Um, so I think one of the things we're gonna see is a renewed debate about that. Two things I wanted to point out about this history. If you think about the two crises that were addressed in this period that I've talked about, penicillin was actually developed, ironically, not even by the Office of Scientific Research and Development, because they thought it was going to be developed by organic chemists at Harvard and MIT. Um, in fact, it was developed by the lowly US Department of Agriculture, the labs in Peoria, um, that developed the way of fermenting and producing penicillin on a large scale. Um, and it was actually the, the War Production Board that paid Merck and Pfizer and Letterly and the other companies, more than, more than a dozen companies that produced penicillin. And it was the, war procur the Defense Procurement Board that actually bought the doses of that for deployment to the front and for civilian uses. Soup to nuts, that was a federal effort. Um, and there actually was not a patent on penicillin. Um, it, was, uh, it, it was an unpatented drug, although there were patents on the production processes, and we can get into that. The other really major thing that happened right after the war was the development of the polio vaccine. And again, NIH was actually not a big part of the story. That was driven by Basil O'Connor and the March of Dimes, mainly at beginning at the end of World War II and then spinning out for the next five years until the Sock and Sabin, Sabin vaccines were developed. The role of NIH and the Food and Drug Administration was more at the back end of that story to make things sure that the vaccine was effective, especially after the, the contamination incident at the Cutter Laboratories um, soon after the, the vaccine was developed. So one of the things that I think is, is somewhat predictable is that we may go back and look at what was the federal role in the development of these two miraculous, one a drug, the other a vaccine, which is precisely what we're looking for to come out of the post-COVID era. Um, and I think we may see a, um, a resurgence of a debate about what is the role of the federal government relative to industry. Let me point back to the slide again. What the slide demonstrates that is that sometimes, quite often, the federal funding is the first thing. It's, it's pure research that leads to a new technology. But if you look at the risk chip, for example, risk chip would look in the biomedical equivalent kind of like a polymerase chain reaction, where the idea actually originates in industry, then comes back into academe, and the first uses of a marvelous new platform technology is actually for research, but then it proves to be really practically useful and creates a billion dollar market in the private sector. So the point of this diagram is actually it's a complex ecosystem, it's nonlinear, and it's not like it's a pure pipeline. Um, we all like to think about the pipeline model and sometimes it works, but um, it's actually much more complicated than that. And um, the inner, inner digitation of the government and industry and academia uh, turns out to be pretty complicated in biomedical research, even as it is shown here in this famous diagram that came from Funding a Revolution, uh, the NAS 
report from the uh, 1990s. So I just wanted to end with that and set the stage for our other speakers to talk about what's going on in the real world right now. Thanks, Bob. Uh, John, over to you. Great. I'm just waiting for my slides to get up. There we go. <clears throat> well, thank you, and thanks for that great introduction. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening um, at basic science and, and some of our thinking uh, related to funding basic biomedical science at the NIH. So NIGMS is one of the 27 institutes and centers at NIH, 24 of which support um, grants given to researchers around the country. Uh, the mission of NIGMS is to support basic research um, that increases our understanding of fundamental biological processes and through that foundation lays, or th through that in information, lays the foundation for advances in disease diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. We also support uh, several clinical areas that affect multiple organ systems, although that's not um, directly germane to the discussion today. And we also are the primary or the, the main funder of training and diversity enhancing efforts at NIH as well. I should say that, that all of the 24 institutes and centers that support research outside of the NIH um, have basic science portfolios that support their particular disease or organ system mission, but NIGMS's primary role is to support basic science. Um, and so therefore we really are considered the basic science institute at NIH. Our budget is close to $3 billion in, in 2020, so that's quite a significant investment that Congress has made uh, in basic biomedical research. Got a next slide, please. Thanks. So um, a few years ago, when the, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry um, was announced um, in, in Sweden for, um, in that case, um, uh, circadian rhythms, a, a reporter at the, um, at, at the press conference asked the Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy why so many Nobel Prizes historically had been given to Americans. And what Goran Hansen replied was that the United States has allowed scientists to perform fundamental research to focus on important questions in science, not forcing them to immediate applications, not controlling them in a political way. And that freedom, and what he's describing, of course, is basic research, combined with very good resources, has been very helpful to the United States. So that's the opinion um, from outside of, of the US and, and from the Royal Swedish Academy. Uh, could I have the next slide or just hit the button? So, you know, in as much as Nobel Prizes may be a measure of outcomes of scientific research, and it's a flawed measure granted and one could quibble with it, but I think it does give some indication of where important breakthroughs in science come from. NIGMS has supported work that's led to 89 Nobel Prizes since 1962 when NIGMS was created. Um, that's out of a total of 160 supported across all of NIH. Uh, again, there's 27 institutes and centers. Um, so the majority of all uh, Nobel Prizes NIH has supported, um, and by far the most of any institute, are supported by the Basic Science Institute at NIH. So I think, again, that gives you maybe some just general sense of um, you know, where investment leads to important breakthroughs um, through basic science. Now the next slide, please. So I'll just end with a few observations um, that, that I've made on, on the importance of basic science and how to support basic science um, during my time, both as a basic researcher uh, and leading the NIGMS for the past seven years. Um, some principles that we think about, um, and these really go back um, centuries, is the first that breakthroughs in research leading to then developments in technologies and applications emerge on a complex foundation of fundamental information and knowledges and knowledge that's contributed by many people over many years. And this you know, has been put by great minds. Newton famously was reported to have said, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, that is his work, which was obviously transformative uh, in the history of science was really predicated on a great foundation of work done by other researchers. 
a pastor put it as uh, saying chance favors only the prepared mind. You know, we often think of discoveries um, as these eureka moments that one person makes a breakthrough. Um, but his point was that, in fact, the reason they were able to make that breakthrough is because of their knowledge and the foundation on which they were standing laid by many, many other researchers in the past. Now, that's an assertion based on looking at history. More and more, though, recently, as, as social scientists and others have studied the scientific process, um, data are coming out that strongly support this contention. And I'd point you to a paper that came out in Cell in 2015 from Scientific Discovery to Cures that, that I note there, in which researchers at the Gladstone Institute and UCSF used big data approaches to, to trace the histories, the scientific lineages, basically, of major breakthroughs in, in the case of what they looked at in the paper, two FDA approved breakthrough drugs that, that um, were um, put on the market in the last few years. And what they found was this contention that um, those drugs were built on many, many years of research. In, in some one case, actually about a century's worth of research um, done by hundreds or in some cases thousands of researchers at hundreds of different institutions. Um, and the NIH has now actually adopted that methodology and, and uses it to look um, at, at a variety of other discoveries. And pretty much all the time, that's what you find is rather than it being a single eureka moment, as we tend to think about um, science as being you know, a, a big bang of some discovery, it really is a very complex web of different strands of information that get woven together over a long period of time uh, to eventually produce that you know, sudden seismic shift, if you will. Could you hit the button again, please? Thanks. Um, and, and that goes to say, again, the breakthroughs usually come from unexpected and surprising areas. Um, so one of the, I think, important things to consider when you're thinking about why to support basic research is that um, if we knew in advance where the big breakthrough was gonna come from that then led to major advances in, in medicine or other applications, uh, we do it right now. But history again shows us that um, most of the time, that's not how it works. Some great discovery comes from some very unexpected and surprising area, um, and therefore it's really important to um, support a broad and diverse portfolio of basic research. Uh, could you hit the button again, please? Um, and going along with that, um, you know, we'd say, why does the National Institutes of Health study um, any organisms other than humans or the you know, array of, of pathogens that prey on humans, viruses, bacteria, et cetera. I mean, of course we do study humans and pathogens, but we also support the study of, of many other organisms, fruit flies, yeasts, um, E. coli, um, and even stranger organisms. And that's because organisms that can be very distant from humans often provide the key insights or provide novel properties that lead to the development of technologies um, that in turn lead to advances in medicine and technology. And just a few, very few out of many, many possible examples um, are drugs such as cisplatin. Um, cisplatin is an anti-cancer drug, one of the, the first uh, discovered and really put into use. It has uh, saved or extended millions of lives worldwide. Uh, and it was discovered by someone who was studying uh, DNA replication and the division of, of bacteria cells in a purely basic science way um, that then led to this you know, blockbuster drug that saved millions of lives. CRISPR, that probably most listeners are familiar with, um, the, the you know, very important technology of the moment to um, modify genomes, a tremendous promise in medicine uh, as well as in research came from uh, studying, again, the novel or uh, the humble bacteria. Circadian clocks, um, fruit flies, for example, tremendously important uh, in our understanding of fruit flies and the Nobel Prize, as I mentioned, was given for studies of uh, circadian clocks and fruit flies that have many implications to medicine. And other examples, regenerative medicine and stem cells um, coming from um, very unusual organisms, including things like salamanders. Um, Next slide, uh, next button, please. And then finally, um, and I alluded to this before, all of this adds up to us to a philosophy that similar to investing in companies or the stock market, when we're thinking about investing in basic biomedical research, 
we want to be supporting a broad and diverse scientific portfolio um, because that maximizes the chances for these breakthroughs, which again come from unexpected and surprising places and uh, organisms distant from humans. Uh, those would be the big payoffs in, in financial uh, markets, you know, investment in companies or stock market. Um, and this in turn, in addition to um, maximizing the chances to actually get the breakthroughs themselves, it also builds the strongest foundation on which those discoveries can emerge. And I think that's really an important concept to, to, to remember here is that the breakthroughs themselves are what we, we see. It's what leads to the advances in, in medical practice and extends life. Um, but all of those things are built on many different strands of smaller um, research results, which in and of themselves may not seem important to an outsider. Um, but again, you know, it's becoming increasingly clear those lead to those discoveries in uh, complex ways. And without those strands, those discoveries would uh, either take a lot longer to happen or wouldn't happen at all. So I will turn it over to the next speaker. Okay. Thanks, John. Paula, you're up. Um, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Well, it's um, my pleasure to be here to present to you um, my thoughts on the importance of basic research uh, for uh, emerging biological threats. And um, no better an example than the current pandemic that we're going through now. And uh, so what I've chosen to do is to focus on some examples that I think really highlight some of the points that the previous two speakers have made, and that is why it's important to fund basic research at the le level of academia and, and basic researchers rather than industry. Um, and I've chosen to present to you three examples because I think they illustrate the point very clearly. Um, they have many common themes between them, and perhaps the three most important is one, um, that they have been um, without a doubt, um, absolutely critical for our current understanding of the COVID-19 pandemic and of, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the disease. Um, and without these technologies, um, we, we would not have been able to uh, advance as quickly as we have done in the current, um, in the past six months or so. Uh, secondly, and perhaps um, most critically for the question of basic research, is the idea that these um, technologies themselves have taken many decades of hard work by many, many scientists. So each of them is around 30 years in length. And so this is a, a huge investment of time and money that perhaps one specific uh, company could not themselves um, undertake. Um, um, and thirdly um, uh, is the collaborative aspect. Uh, the, uh, um, the findings and the, the breakthroughs in each of these areas has been the result of uh, uh, collaboration and community team science from many scientists, not just in this country, but across the world. And so the areas I'm gonna highlight today are, um, firstly, uh, the human, human Genome Project, of which you are all very familiar, I'm sure. Secondly, uh, CRISPR-Cas, which was alluded to just now. And thirdly, the area of cryo-electron microscopy. So the Human Genome Project, as we all know, started in the 1990s. Um, and this timeline I'm showing you across the top here um, depicts the first 13 years of the Human Genome Project culminating in 2003 with the publication of the fully um, uh, sequenced human genome. And it was really a remarkable endeavor undertaken by many, many, many scientists. And along the way, we saw also the emergence of other genome um, projects, um, sequencing of single cell organisms such as E. coli um, and archaeobacteria, um, moving on to multicellular organisms such as um, the C. elegans, the roundworm, uh, fruit flies, plants such as Ara Arabidopsis, the lab, uh, the lab rodents that we use for our research, and then again, uh, finally in 2003, the human genome. Um, and what's remarkable here is that in this era, um, since the 1990s, something in the order of about 3,500 species have been sequenced. So remember, the human genome, um, if you look at this graph here, this sort of takes off where the timeline leave, uh, left in the early 2000s when the human genome was published. And we see here that the human genome took um, over 10 years to sequence at the cost of tens of millions of dollars. 
Um, in today's world, we can now sequence a single genome within two weeks, and it costs about $900. So we've come a huge way in this era um, through the endeavors of, of many scientists. So what led to these increases in speed and this massive reduction in cost? Well, uh, predominantly it was investment by the NIH, both in the basic research um, to develop these tools, in the various genome projects that I've alluded to, and also in the publication of public databases and the availability of public data for many scientists across the world to tap into and use for their research. Along the same lines, we have huge advances advances in computer um, technology and, and um, uh, competence, uh, both at the hardware and the software level, um, huge advance, advances in next-gen sequencing, cloud computing, et cetera, all of which led to this you know, rapid increase in time that we now um, see. How does this help with, oops, how does this help with the pandemic such as um, COVID-19? Well, our understanding of uh, things such as um, patient susceptibility is very much informed by our understanding of the genome. If we could understand why certain patients are more susceptible than others um, or have um, greater severity of disease than others, then we could perhaps develop treatment options for them. Uh, similarly, if we understand the genome of the virus itself, we can begin to compare it to other viruses, similar viruses such as SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, and we can leverage these similarities as we look towards drug development. Um, at the same time, we can understand the different, if we understand the differences between these viruses, we can understand things like um, why this virus is particularly um, infectious. And then, of course, we have to be um, honest with ourselves and say that this is not the, the last pandemic we will encounter. There will be other pandemics in the future. And so understanding the genome of this virus and its mutation rate, for example, will prepare us in the future for the next pandemic. And so um, what I'm going to show you here in this moving graphic is the timeline of sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus since it emerged in, in Wuhan, China. In, in November. So what you will see is um, in purple, you'll see um, viral sequencing um, in Asia. In the greens, you'll see viral sequencing in Europe and then in the reds in North and South America. And if I start this movie, I hope you can see it. You see that starting in December when the first viral genomes were sequenced, you begin to see already that the virus is mutating as we go, as we spread across Asia. Then as we move into Europe in the green, you start to see new variants emerge in Europe. And then when it hits America, the Americas, you start to see even further mutations in the virus. Why is this important to, to um, understand? Well, we know um, what I'm showing you across the bottom is the viral genome. And we can see that there are various areas of the viral genome that are particularly susceptible to mutation. Clearly, these are areas that we need to understand, but, but it makes sense that these are not areas that we should be developing drugs against because potentially they'll change and then you will get drug resistance. So this sort of information about the genome tells us a lot about the virus itself. And as an example of that, this is just a paper I pulled uh, last week. It, it came out from Scripps um, showing that they had sequenced one virus and found a single point mutation within the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Many of you have probably heard about the spike protein. It's an, um, a protein that's on the surface of the viral capsid and is thought to be very important for infectivity. This single point mutation rampantly increases infectivity of the virus. And so understanding the role of spike protein and this particular residue is going to be critical for our targeting of this, of, of this particular uh, residue for, for um, drug ability. On the other side of the spectrum is understanding the host genetics. In other words, understanding the genome environment um, of ourselves. So we can, uh, there's a, a new global initiative called the COVID-19 Host Genetics Initiative, which involves um, labs from all across the world, um, working together to try and understand how the genome and the genetic sequence of individual patients can alter their susceptibility or the severity of their disease. Similarly, it's important to understand how this is, how severity and susceptibility occur across the animal kingdom. So for example, why are ferrets so susceptible to COVID-19, whereas other organisms such as dogs don't appear to be? Understanding the, um, these aspects of the host will uh, enable us to develop drugs in a more effective way. My second example is CRISPR-Cas, which has already been uh, alluded to. 
And as we know, CRISPR-Cas was identified in around 2007 as an adaptive immune system present in bacteria to defend themselves against viruses. Um, now, we know um, that the power of CRISPR-Cas is remarkable. We have um, the potential to, to use CRISPR-Cas for genome editing in humans and potentially one day to, to cure disease. In the lab, we use this all the time for genome editing to alter the genome of our uh, favorite organisms and discover what those uh, genetic sequences do. We can use it for um, DNA imaging, for example, and we can even use CRISPR-Cas for turning gene expression on and off as, as, as we, we wish. But it's important to remember that although the past 10 years has seen an explosion in CRISPR-Cas um, understanding, um, this research dates way back to the 80s when the discover of these clustered repeats that underlie the CRISPR system were first discovered. And so the advances we've made just in the past 10, 10 years has required decades of research to get to this point, decades of fundamental basic research. Um, um, more recently, it's become clear that CRISPR-Cas can also target RNA, certain modules of CRISPR-Cas. And why is this important to SARS-CoV-2? Uh, well, um, this is just one example. Um, this is the um, uh, Sherlock CRISPR detection system, which has been leveraged to um, uh, develop a, an RNA detection system for the virus. And the idea is that you take a sample prep, it could be a a uh, nasopharyngeal swab, it could be a blood sample from a patient, you extract the RNA and you amplify it, and then you see, seek out uh, specifically the viral RNA using CRISPR detection methods. The CRISPR detection method is linked to a, a luminescent reporter, and then you get a simple light read out out of a simple uh, machine that can detect this stuff. Um, this has really um, sped up the potential for testing. So, for example, uh, lamp-mediated uh, amplification of RNA is um, a, a really rapid way to amplify the genome and to look for specific um, signatures that are specific to the virus. Um, and you can get results in less than an, an hour. So you could imagine that a, a office, every office would have one of these machines every week. Um, the uh, workers would come in and get tested and you could um, identify infected patients very quickly, send them home and prevent community spread. And then in my third and final example, um, I'd like to uh, talk to you about cryo-electron microscopy. Um, as opposed to other protein um, analysis tools, what cryo-EM does is it allows you to look at native protein structure within a cell. So in, 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 in terms of looking at how a protein functions at the level of the cell, this is a much more in vivo um, approach to getting atomic resolution imaging. Um, importantly, you can look at protein-protein interactions and you can look at protein-drug interactions. So um, this is really uh, a key tool that people are using right now for um, understanding components of the, of the viral membrane, viral capsid. Um, and this work was a culmination of um, 30 plus years of research by chemists, by um, imaging experts, um, and it led to the Nobel Prize in 2017. So what are we doing, uh, what is cryo-EM doing for um, COVID-19 research? Well, this is a cryo-EM image of the spike protein that I mentioned earlier. This is the, the viral membrane to which the spike protein is tethered, and you can see a side view of the protein. This is a top view lo looking down on the protein. And then this is the same sort of imaging, cryo-EM imaging, with an antibody bound to the uh, spike protein. So this purple area here is the bound antibody, again, from the side view and from the top view. And what this allows um, researchers to do is look with high resolution at these surface structures and potential candidates for drug therapy, and to compare, for example, the spike protein um, in SARS-CoV-1 with other SARS viruses to understand what features of the spike protein may be conserved and which can be used for future um, drug targeting. And then to take the thousands of uh, drug candidates and, and look in a more specific way at how those drugs may interact with the surface of the virus. And so you can uh, potentially whittle down many, many, many different drug candidates into a more uh, manageable size uh, list of, of candidates to then um, address. And again, the importance of this technique is that you can also look at the, the interaction of viral components with the host proteins as well, so you can understand how infectivity uh, starts. Um, so those are my three examples. I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions, um, and I now open it back up to the uh, floor. 
Great. Thank you so much. Um, so in the uh, interest of time, um, I'm going to, why don't we go ahead and open things up for uh, audience Q&A now. I have some questions prepared as well. So uh, people should feel free to just start asking questions and we can integrate them into our discussion um, so that we make sure we have time for that. Um, uh, and uh, again, thank you. Thanks to our panelists for uh, uh, for uh, those presentations. Um, I thought one thing it might be helpful just to kind of uh, step back a little bit um, is think about how we are defining our terms. So the, the first question I wanted to ask, and I think maybe this this is something that uh, let's start with John, but uh, other others may want to uh, jump in here as well. Is what exactly do we mean by basic science? Um, you know, how, do, how are we differentiating that from other kinds of scientific research? I ask because something that I notice in a lot of policy discussions is a, uh, a ready conflation between basic scientific research and long-term research, you know, product development that takes a long time um, that the DOD might do or the private sector um, or, you know, maybe kinds of uh, not obviously useful applied research. And this may partly track this nonlinear dynamic that Bob was describing, but it also seems like there is a real distinction here and, you know, um, a lot of what we're talking about depends on that. And so I'm just curious to know how, how we should understand that, especially for you know, folks who are not part of the scientific community. What is it that we're asking um, taxpayers to support when we say basic science? So maybe beginning with John, but uh, others feel free to jump in. Yeah, it's a great, great question. <clears throat> um, so th the way we look at it is it's scientific research that is not targeted at an applied goal, an immediate applied goal. So trying to understand, uh, in our case, how biological or chemical systems operate, um, starting you know, for the sake of understanding that and gaining fundamental knowledge. Um, that knowledge, as I said, then creates a foundation on which one can um, promote applied advances. But, but I think you, you raise a really good point, which is that, you know, we were thinking, we're talking about sort of like it's one or the other. It's really, there is a continuum. You know, there are things that are at the very basic end of the spectrum, purely curiosity driven, purely fundamental research. Um, there are things that are maybe more in the middle that are um, still basic, but one can begin to see where the, you know, applied um, aspects of them may be coming, you know, and CRISPR, there are many things in that area now. Uh, and then at the far end, there's, you know, development where you have a, a product and you are working to make it, you know, harden it into something that can actually be used um, for whatever its purpose is. Um, I think this is important. I'll just say before I turn it over that um, to, to think about because, you know, you will see reports on, for instance, how much basic research is being done by industry versus supported by you know, federal sources or other um, funding agencies. And, and it's very important to recognize that those, um, the data sources there are really left up to the organization that's reporting it to decide what's basic or not. And if you talk to people in the pharmaceutical industry, as I've done, they will, I think, tell you that what they define as basic research is more in the middle of the spectrum, that gray area I talked about, than at the very basic side of the spectrum. You know, so uh, one thing that we might do, Tony, uh, is, is in answer to that question, is point out something about uh, those terms, because those terms were kind of set in place in the 1950s, and in some ways they aren't terribly useful. And one of the places where they're least useful is in biomedical research because people applying for NIH grants almost always have some idea in mind about how what they're doing in the lab might be useful in some way, but there may be a really long time lag. And CRISPR is a brilliant example of that, right? It's, we didn't even know for years that it had anything to do with the, the defense of bacteria against viruses, let alone that it was gonna be this incredibly powerful uh, technology. Um, it was a bunch of people that nobody would heard of uh, working on bacteria in obscure places that were doing the groundwork until it kind of escalated to the point that Dowden and Charpentier stepped in and turned it into a, a, a miraculous technology. Um, but Donald Stokes 
made a point about uh, 25 years ago that's really important. In the biomedical sciences, I think what we mean by basic science is creating knowledge that's really widely useful. It's intellectually engaged, and therefore, it's not that there's no thought of practical application. It's that what you're really interested in is what's going on mechanistically, what can we learn from this, in contrast to when you're doing a clinical trial where the outcome of what you do with a clinical trial is, does it work or does it not work? It's kind of a binary. Um, but most basic research is trying to understand general mechanisms and things like that. And when you're doing that kind of research, Donald Stokes called that Pasteur's quadrant because Pasteur, of all people, studied fermentation and very practical stuff for the beer industry. Um, and at the same time, was also pushing fundamental knowledge. So you actually don't have to make a choice between doing something that's intellectually powerful and highly practical, usually when you're doing biomedical research. So what NIH, I think, sees as basic research, um, instantly, all of NIH research, for all intents and purposes, as of about 10 years ago, is classified as basic research in the NSF categories. Um, even though under the NSF definition of 1950 in the Prescotti manual that's used to categorize research worldwide, supposedly that's supposed to only apply to things that have no thought of practical application. Well, yeah, not really. Nobody really behaves that way. Something, I, uh, this is uh, dovetails nicely with um, previous two points and uh, also uh, a question I wanted to follow up um, with you, Paula, on something you said, which is, what the government's role here is. Um, and so you, you had mentioned um, that you have this sort of uh, web uh, that is involved in the development of these uh, innovations, say. Um, and then that may be one reason why it would be challenging for one company, say, to do things. And we were, we're just talking here about uh, you know, whether research is use-driven uh, and whether the private sector is uh, or is not. Uh, in, uh, investing a lot here. I mean, we know historically the private sector used to invest uh, quite a bit in some basic science, like the Bell Labs model. Um, I, I'm curious to know uh, from where you sit, what, you, what your thoughts are on the government's role. Is, is this the kind of research something that is a genuine public good uh, and it must be funded by government? Is there a role for private sector? Uh, how do you understand that relationship? I mean, my, my view on this is that any any area of research where you need um, the involvement and the investment by many researchers, more than a, a company can possibly employ, um, is an area that the government should consider um, its domain. So these public databases for our, our genome biology are, you know, they're indispensable. I mean, you cannot function in a lab now without accessing the public databases that NIH has made available or Wellcome Trust or other institutions across the world. So, so this sort of public domain accessibility is absolutely crucial for everything we do. Um, and that's not just the genome information that we gather, it's the epigenome information, it's the non-coding information we gather. This, this idea that, that we are not just our genomes or our epigenomes has really arisen from many, many different investigators working across the globe. And, and that could have been an area that would have been completely overlooked by industry because it wasn't traditionally targetable um, uh, back when the Human Genome Project was way in its infancy. So I think these areas that maybe aren't initially considered um, um, uh, in investment wise are areas that we should cover and, and also areas where you know global participation from researchers across the, the world is absolutely crucial for our understanding. Um, I mean CRISPR is a, such a beautiful example because I don't think in the 80s when they found these repeat sequences and started studying these funky little um, um, systems they had any clue where this would take us now and and so since 2007 the explosion has been you know, really remarkable. But, but but prior to that, there was very little activity that, that people like myself would have noticed. So I think you need to keep that investment because you never know where this is going to take you. And so I want to stick with the issue of uh, funding for, for a minute. And um, you know, so uh, Bob had mentioned that NIH had sort of overtaken other federal entities and, and maybe other entities generally um, at a certain point in time. 
Um, it, what's interesting about NIH funding is that it's, it has been historically a, a, an area that has uh, enjoyed fairly bipartisan support, uh, at, at least at certain periods of time. Um, you know, and there was this uh, moment at the end of the 20th century, the NIH budget, and a kind of contraction. Um, and I, I, I see, uh, it, I see that as part of um, a, a fairly general trend where the federal government has uh, taken more of a backseat um, in R&D vis-a-vis uh, -vis the private sector as compared to that post-war period that Bob was talking about. Um, and yet in recent years, there has been a kind of you know, uptick in, in support for NIH funding. Um, very recently, partly because of uh, COVID-19, but uh, over the past five years, we can see positive trends there. Some folks point out that uh, you know, as a percentage of GDP, uh, and I, the NIH budget remains below 2003 levels. I, I'm curious to know from, this is really, uh, I think, a question for all of you, um, whether this, this is a problem, you know, whether the NIH budget uh, should be growing faster um, or, or more, uh, you know, where, kind of where are we? You know, I think to, to the layman, the, the numbers that we're talking about are quite large, you know, 40 billion plus for overall, uh, overall NIH budget. Um, is is that sufficient? Um, and uh, you know, what do we need to do better? Maybe John would be a natural place to begin. Well, you know, I I, I don't comment on on what uh, the the budget should be. I just use the budget that Congress appropriates to us in the most effective and efficient ways we can. Um, you know, but there is always good science left on the table when funding decisions are made. You know, and, and as I said. Um, we think, in at least in terms of basic science, it's extremely important to support as broad and diverse a portfolio as you can. As Paul alluded to, you, you don't know where the breakthrough is going to come from. Um, and and I, th I think that's an important thing to consider um, when thinking about these issues. Yeah, and I think we can step in to say what John can't because we're not feds. Um, so, so here's COVID is your classic example. One of the dawning awarenesses in the American public, I think, is yet again, oh my gosh, the economy doesn't work if people aren't healthy. We're talking about a shock that is a multi-trillion dollar shock to our economy. And the only way we're gonna dig out from it is actually through R&D. That's, that's just simply the facts. We need vaccines and we need drugs. Um, and what we're doing right now is we're taking the research that we had up to the point that COVID hit and trying to apply it very rapidly. And what we're talking about today is, oh, in the long run, what we really need is a very, very powerful engine supporting the base and lift all ships simultaneously and do a lot more basic research that would put us in a position to respond more quickly the next time something like this comes around. Um, so I think, number one, if you look historically at what happens, we do respond to shocks. R&D is usually part of the response post Amerithrax in 2001, there was a huge boost in the budget. It was the last infusion of the doubling uh, of NIH's budget. And you're right, we went into a 10 year stagflation period of NIH where costs were going up and the congressional appropriations, even in absolute dollars, were actually decreasing a couple of those years for 10 years. But now for the last four or five years, it's actually five years now, um, there's been an incremental steady increase, and I think we're back to the politics. My prediction after COVID is the public is going to be thinking, oh my gosh, we really, really underinvested in the basic knowledge and technologies we need to be prepared for the next time. And I think that NIH and the research infrastructure in general will probably get a disproportionate share of the increases in funding despite the fact there's gonna be unbelievably intense pressure because of the ballooning of, of the deficit. So, so I'm ever the optimist. Um, don't ask a scientist if NIH should have more funding because we'll always say yes. But, um, but you know, the, the slide I showed with the, you know, the, the amazing amount of sequencing that's being done on the virus, you know, in six months, we have sequenced 3000 viruses, whereas, 30 years ago, it took 10 years to sequence a single genome. We've come so far. So the expense has been huge, but, but the payoff is 
it's even, even bigger. And I think that we will learn so much here that we can take forward. The time now is not to stop funding this, it's to keep going. And then the other aspect that we've seen emerge out of all of this is biosecurity, is that security of the nation and security of the world is absolutely critical. So this isn't just us trying to make people healthier. This is actually, you know, this is actually preparing us for biosecurity as we move forward. So I think there are many reasons to increase uh, federal spending on research, uh, you know, beyond just the understanding of the biology that is so critical. So we're, we're just going a little bit going over time here. I want to uh, remind uh, viewers that they should feel free to ask questions uh, in our remaining uh, extra couple minutes here. Um, one one uh, viewer did ask, um, piggybacking on the recent pandemic we're still experiencing, do we think the risks we're taking in the lab are worth the successes we have received and will receive from re research? And I think, Paul, your, your, your answer to, to the earlier question speaks to that a bit. And I'd like to just maybe dilate on it a, a little bit more. Um, you know, a theme running through this discussion is that there is this uh, complex web um, uh, of scientific research that you know, ultimately benefits society um, and that serendipity plays a role uh, and it's hard to predict. So I, I think the challenge is you know, how uh, you know, resources are scarce uh, you know, for choosing between applied research versus more basic research on that continuum. You know, how do we how do we make the decision as policymakers, as, as taxpayers, how to make to allocate uh, in that way, um, and how do we measure the, the you know the return on investment? Obviously, not all basic scientific research is going to bear uh, technological medical fruit. Um, so how do we how do we sort of justify that, um, and, and 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 is it worth it? And I I could be for for uh, for anybody. Well, I, I, I mean, I can say that um, since I've been dealing with a lot of the COVID-19 researchers at Cornell, um, it's worth it to them because they want to help. So you know, the risk to the individual is nothing. It's what we do. Uh, healthcare professionals have been doing this for the past six months, putting themselves on the front line um, and researchers want to do the same thing. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I think, um, the investment is is worthwhile both in terms of personnel and 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 funding and tony just to address the question that came in from the audience i i think the risks are there um and the places the labs that are doing most of the research on um COVID are going to be the labs that are best prepared to do that uh, we're, we're going to be doing this in bsl um biosafety facilities um, that are actually used to dealing with biohazard in a big way. Um, and I don't think there's really a choice about it because there aren't too many risks that are going to consume 200,000 American lives in less than a year, which is what we're facing right now. And um, so I think we kind of have to figure it out. This is an R&D problem right now, and it has to be turned into a practical Let's get the stuff that we need, the vaccines, the treatments. Um, and even if it's only amelioration or reduction of risk, uh, we need to get there as quickly as we can. And I don't think there's really much debate about that or whatever. How to set priorities, I don't think there's any formula. And I don't think there ever will be a formula. And what NIH has devised is a brilliant mechanism that leaves most of the politics at the level of Congress at the level of major diseases like cancer, heart disease, and medical, general medical sciences at the level of the institutes. Each of the institutes has its own sets of patrons and champions. Um, and at one time, it may be Alzheimer's disease that's in the sunshine, and another time, it may be cancer, another time, diabetes. Right now, it's infectious disease. Um, and I think it's, that's at the level of Congress, that's what the investment is going for. I think the way we measure the system overall is to say, are we getting what we want out of it? And what we want out of it is better health and also economic development. Um, and we have some metrics for each of those things, um, but none of those metrics are very perfect and they're certainly never gonna reduce to a formula. So I think we're left with a political answer to your question is it's the US Congress that decides how much money goes to NIH every year. 
and that's an annual political process. And the citizens have weighed in on that year after year. And I think that's the main reason that except for that decade period after the doubling, NIH has been popular in both parties. Both parties don't like Alzheimer's disease, cancer, or diabetes. <laughs> it's the one thing that both parties seem to be able to agree on. Well, but end with just uh, one last question here. Um, so this this uh, speaks a little bit to th this idea of a, you know the, the complex network, and also something that John mentioned about um, uh, having a diverse portfolio. Um, you know, we've been focusing on the life sciences. Um, what what is the role for other other science? You know, the physical sciences, the kind of broader spectrum. Um, I, I want to read a, a quote from Harold Varmus, former director of NIH. Um, this was from an op-ed uh, back in 2000 in the Washington Post. He said, medical advances may seem like wizardry, but pull back the curtain and sitting at the lever as a high energy physicist, a combinatorial chemist, or an engineer, scientists can wage an effective war on disease only if we, as a nation and as a scientific community, harness the energies of many disciplines, not just biology and medicine. The allies must include mathematicians, physicists, engineers, and the computer and behavioral scientists. And I think uh, Bob and, and uh, former uh, the late Senator Kilgore would add social science as well. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know um, your thoughts on what role the other sciences play and what implications that might have for uh, science policy funding. Uh, maybe beginning with John. I, I think what Harold said is absolutely right. I mean, you look at uh, the history of medical breakthroughs and again, it's, it's not just it's a complex web of biomedical research, it's a complex web of physics research of mathematical you know research of computer science that that all feeds into that and and those fields need support not just for medical research breakthroughs um, but for you know advances and other things that are essential to our health well-being and national security you think of quantum computing uh, you know immediately springs to mind artificial intelligence um, th those things will be critically important um, if they, you know, fully come to fruition in advancing medical breakthroughs, but also in, in many other uh, realms of our society and can make things better or worse, depending on, um, you know, who uh, advances them um, and who maybe lags behind. Well, Tony, and, and just a comment, it's funny that you should mention that Harold Varmus editorial because that slide that I prepared for Bruce Alberts in 2000 two was actually prepared because Harold Varmus had been talking about this and at the academies we were actually worried that we were nearing the ending of the doubling of the NIH budget and what had happened to the physical sciences at NSF and, and even within the Department of Defense is relative diminution of the, rel of the fraction of the R&D budget that was going to the physical sciences and the sense was and Harold was making the argument hey let's not leave them behind that's also important um, and it was uh, interesting that the head of the NIH was making the argument hey let's support Department of Energy and the atomic well the, the relics of the what, what was the Atomic Energy Commission and the National Science Foundation and uh, basic engineering at, at uh, NSF so when it when it comes to basic research it's basic and uh, the physical sciences have something to contribute. Turns out NIH supports, and in fact, John's Institute supports a fair amount of pretty high, high tech whiz bang stuff. The Human Genome Project grew out of that institute. The first $5 million and the first four or five employees were people that worked at NIGMS and moved over to the Genome Project as, as Jim Watson was uh, getting it off the runway. And Tony, you, you, you asked about measuring the outcome, which is, you know, always difficult when the timelines are so long. But if you look at, at patents as a measure of outcomes, it's the basic science, you know, the engineering and the basic science institute at NIH that have the best um, patent outcomes for the dollar. Interesting. Yep. And Paula, uh, final word? Yeah, so I mean, I'll underscore with cryo-EM, you know, cryo-EM was developed by a bunch of chemists and physicists. It, it only became, in my mind, truly interesting when the biologists uh, got involved. But, you know, before that, it was totally within the chemistry space. Um, and the, the nitty gritty of getting cryo-EM up and running was really about, um, you know, resolution of these structures. And then I'll say just uh, from the Cornell perspective, 
the first facility we got up and running after our lockdown was our high energy synchrotron because we realized mm. that if we're going to try and target um, this virus, we need physicists uh, up and running as quickly as possible. Plus, it takes about three weeks to get a synchrotron up and running, I, I discovered. Um, but, um, you know, the physicists are there underlying everything. And, you know, let's not forget the engineering scientists. You know, many of the applications that we're using at Cornell or we're developing at Cornell are detection methods and, and diagnostics. And so the engineers play a crucial role in this. So. Um, you know, I'm a biologist, but I can understand that I stand on the back of, of many other, other science disciplines. Great. Well, we are officially over time here, so I think we're going to have to, uh, to end. Um, but I just want to thank uh, our panelists for, for joining us and for taking the time to share their, their time and uh, their insights. Um, so thank you. I want to thank the uh, uh, folks for tuning in. Um, I, we're all probably experiencing a bit of Zoom fatigue, so I, uh, I'm grateful for you uh, to, for joining. Uh, and lastly, I also want to thank uh, Cornell University, since this the idea for this event actually hatched out of discussions um, we ha we're having uh, with, with folks over there. Uh, and so thanks to you all. And uh, please feel free to follow up with, with me uh, if you have questions about this topic um, or would like to be connected to uh, the panelists um, to follow up. So thanks very much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Tony, and thank Antonia for organizing all this in the background. Yep. yep.